Okay, uh, so thanks Maggie. And uh, thank you for being here. Maggie introduced to October's, uh, introduced me a little bit, so I won't spend much time here. Um, the one thing she didn't mention uh, to October's does focus on working with purpose-driven organizations uh, and we are in the process of becoming a certified B Corp. Um, we are uh, close to uh, finishing that process, which is, is very exciting for us. Um, and being a B Corp means um, we believe that business can be a force for good and balance uh, our impact on society, the environment um, against sort of our, our goal of making revenue. So if you don't know anything about B Corp, strongly recommend you check them out. Great, um, great organization and great global movement. Uh, so this is, um, does anybody actually know when The Big Lebowski came out? Uh, feel free to put it in chat if, um, if you do. Oh, um, so while you're thinking about that, and of course everybody has access to search, but uh, I, Maggie mentions, um, I am also a professor. I teach analytics and search engine marketing at University of Denver. Um, and uh, co-founded two Octobers with Chris Skavish, who's also um, uh, listening in. Um, 95, I think it was 98, but um, I don't know that I could sit, honestly say I've been doing digital analytics since 95, but I have been doing it since 98. So um, the, uh, so if it was, Put out in 95 maybe it just meant it was it had a long theater run um so uh yeah i guess i've been at it for a long time when i started <clears throat> google wasn't even a thing um google came out um really i guess i got into web development in in 97 and in in 98 google had just released but nobody had heard of it um and uh i do remember my first google search um, the, when I, so back then we used web trends a lot, um, and then urchin, which is what Google bought, which became Google analytics. But, um, I love the data, um, that I guess I love the me measurability of, of digital. Um, I wasn't a marketing person before that and really started out in, in web development. Um, so. Uh, I love, I love things we can measure, and I think one of the things that I've really learned over the years is um, to be aware of and respectful of the things that we can't measure too, which I'll, I'll touch on a little bit. But um, so um, that's how I got my start. We uh, one of the things that I was curious about, if, if anybody um, is is up for sharing, is so I'm going to be talking about. Uh, analytics and, and automation for multi-location businesses. Uh, are there specific businesses that you work with that, um, like, I, you know, I, I saw the list of, of people that had signed up and, and it seems like some people are um, either work for themselves or as consultants. Some people work for businesses. Um, I'd love to know what kinds of businesses you work with and what uh, if, if you were interested in multi-location, do you work with businesses that have multiple locations and how many? Is it three locations, a hundred locations? Um, so if anybody's willing to share in chat uh, now or later, I'll keep, I'll keep moving. Um, but I would love to know and, and, and it also, if I can sort of try to provide um, content that's, that's relevant. Um, so, um, the thing is, Nico, yes. so uh, Tim, who just joined, says he's, he's working with two locations. I've worked everything from two locations to almost 100, 150, and I'm excited to hear all that in detail because there are some challenges that go across, you know, 
a hundred locations that you also find those challenges in two or three locations, but there are also some efficiencies to be gained with fewer scale. But so we've got two locations from Tim, two locations from Robert, um, but just wanted you to have that context. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so, so hopefully this will, uh, what I'm gonna talk about will be useful with two locations and, and um, especially if you aspire to more locations. So getting started off on the right, right foot. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with a little story that, that I think for us as an organization um, really kind of propelled us forward in our, in our thinking about doing marketing for multi-location businesses. I'm gonna talk a bit about KPIs and dashboards and, and specifically Google Data Studio dashboards. Um, though what I'll describe could be relevant if you use other dashboarding tools. And then how to, how to start down the path of automation. Um, if you're already building your own tools, uh, would love to hear about that too. Um, you know, as much as possible, we love these, uh, when we do these webinars to, to make them, um, to share ideas and, and for those of you that joins um, after Maggie's intro, there will be time after uh, sort of roughly speaking, the, the, I'll be spending an hour talking and then we'll open up for office hours just to, just to, to answer questions, talk about ideas. Um, so uh, we've, we've had some, when we've done this, people have shared some, some really valuable insights from their experiences as well. So. Okay, so multi-location story. Uh, we one of the one of the verticals or, or types of clients that we've worked with, and we're an agency, so we have a bunch of of clients that do um, in different verticals. We don't specialize on a single vertical. We we have worked quite a bit with uh, organizations that manage and market apartments, um, and and that's a I think that's a pretty, it's a pretty interesting example of multi-location businesses because in apartment marketing, you, uh, first of all, it's super local, which makes it interesting um, that, you know, you're not, I mean, you really need to target sometimes around a pretty small radius um, and certainly people outside that radius that are looking for that location. But the more challenging thing about it is that campaigns start and stop really off, uh, often. And if a business that owns apartments and rents apartments will, I mean, their whole goal is occupancy. And if they reach a certain level of occupancy, typically they'll shut off marketing altogether because they know that at a certain point, the building will basically um, sustain itself. That, that you know, once you've reached full occupancy, um, market conditions will dictate that people who are looking will sign up for leases. And so, um, so there's just a lot of stopping and starting of campaigns. Um, so occupancy dips, they wanna turn it back on, uh, they open a new building, uh, they wanna fire up marketing again. So that posed some particular challenges. The, the example here is, is one that we worked with. Um, they, they're kind of in the high end of the apartment market uh, they, and they are, have um, apartments in multiple cities in the, mostly in the Western US. Um, and uh, they, they hired us, we were, um, uh, we did search marketing, display marketing for them uh, and analytics. And, and um, the, I think one of the things that was particularly challenging is their budgets would get pretty small. Um, so as low as $250 per location, which as an agency, the, the time that we get, you know, we only make a fraction of that because, because that's a lot of that money goes to Google and Facebook, et cetera. Um, so how to efficiently manage becomes critically important. Um, things that, that we, um, really struggled with 
So one was just this problem of they kept, like they kept turning things off and turning things on. And so we kept finding ourselves having to create completely new campaigns for new buildings and in new locations. Um, and then just month to month, we also had to provide reporting, uh, which also sort of the burden of time was proportional to the number of locations um, that we managed. Uh, so, um, so when you just sort of think about like, like we get paid a certain amount and, and if you're doing it for your own business and you have a finite amount of time. And so uh, each of the things that eats into that time means, you know, either you just run out of time altogether or you just have really limited time to actually think about how to do things better. Um, the, so I guess, sort of where things really came to a head is that, I mean, not only did we not have much time to be strategic and, and sort of the client, I mean, they understand the math, but there is a certain point at which they're like, okay, well, but we hired you to do this. Um, and are you really adding value if all you're doing is, is just sort of doing the bare minimum to get things done? Um, and so we're scrambling and, and in that environment also making mistakes, which is what led us down a, a path of, okay, how can we become more efficient? How can we take the things um, that we have to do month in and month out and uh, make them efficient such that we can start to add more, more value to what we're doing and test out new ideas. Um, so I'll go into some of the specific things that we did, but, but the, the, just a few um, tidbits. So when, before we started automating processes, it took us about three hours to do a new campaign build. Um, and when you think about sort of the math of the, you know, that $250 um, campaign uh, and, and we're only making a small fraction of that as the agency, uh, we really just didn't have three hours to build. So, so you know, not all budgets were that small, but um, so we got that from three hours down to 20 minutes and I'll show you how um, in a little bit. We went sort of towards this, this dashboard approach of trying to automate data flow as much as possible so that human beings weren't doing the custom cutting and pasting and preparing of, of reports. Um, so that we could spend more time analyzing data and in, in, in communicating with the client. Um, and another thing we did, I'm not going to talk about this too much because it really isn't about automation, but we came up with schedule, a schedule of bulk tasks of things that we would do. Um, and again, sort of keeping in mind, this is a large number of accounts and they were coming and going. For those of you that only have a few locations, this is maybe less useful. But um, we would do things like say, okay, we're gonna do ad testing um, every three months and we're gonna do, uh, go through and do an analysis of um, mobile traffic every three months. And we cre cre created this cadence of things that we were gonna be doing on a schedule that made sure that every location got, um, got some love. Cause, Cause I think that's, one of the things that can inevitably happen is, is if you're short on time, then you start to put your energy into the locations that, um, you know, honestly, sometimes complain the most. So trying to avoid that. Uh, so with, through this process, um, we could start adding strategic value and, and really that, that made all the difference. Um, so at a high level, what I want to talk about, like everything I'm going to talk about from now on, has to do with this idea of, of creating really good templates and then creating copies of those templates um, on a per location basis. So, so a lot of your optimization happens at the template level, which I, I mean, I don't know. As you think about it, it seems kind of obvious, but it has been difficult for us, like, doesn't necessarily come naturally that that the idea that you're going to spend time optimizing a campaign that isn't actually for a real business that it's just a template isn't um, 
doesn't necessarily come naturally to people, um, but the benefits make it uh, well worthwhile. So, so when I say this, what I mean is that, um, like, for example, in um, the, let's say, analytics setup, we would create a template and we would say, okay, these are the things that we're going to track and these are going to be the goal numbers and we're going to set up segments and dashboards and analytics. Um, and, and those are going to be like, these are going to be standard. And so when we set up a new location, we're going to follow this template and the goal numbers will be the same, which means that when we feed data into dashboards, if we use, like if we're measuring conversions, we know what goal number three is, um, that, that everything is standardized. So a new location comes on we, and we just deploy a copy of what it is that we're doing. Um, by doing that, we can have checklists, um, we can have Q&A processes in place. So we get faster, but we also do a better job. Um, and it also means that because you've got it well-defined, um, the person who's actually doing the work doesn't necessarily need to be an expert at, at, at Google Analytics. Um, so then the, the other part of the philosophy is that it's still important to customize. So different locations have different needs, but keep your customization separate from your copy. So, so going back to the example of Google Analytics, the, it's fine to have goals. Like if one location has a kind of goal, like let's say that um, the building also rents out space for events um, and other apartment buildings you market don't do that. Well, you can create goals related to people that are interested inquiring about events but make sure that you don't mess with your template. And the reason that that's important is that in the future, if you make improvements to your template, you want to roll them out to all your locations easily. And if you have to worry about the fact that you've started making changes to each location and you're gonna overwrite those changes, then you have big problems. So simple example, but if goal numbers one through five, nobody can touch and you make changes um, to how you do goal tracking uh, in one of those goals, and you deploy them, you don't break anything. So at a conceptual level, that's kind of the basic idea is put a lot of energy into the template, template use, create copies so that you have, like you can get new campaigns up quickly um, and, and have them be complete uh, and then make customizations that don't interfere with your copy. Um, and one thing Maggie mentioned this, but, but Anywhere along the way, um, feel free to ask questions, um, pop them into chat, and, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to address or, or really any kind of interjection. Um, I am a, a, a teacher and professor, and um, class is a lot less fun for, for me when nobody asks questions. So, you know, no pressure, but maybe a little bit of pressure. Okay, so, so that's an example. And, and like I say, I mean, this was for us just sort of being in the situation where we had this client, we were challenged, we didn't feel like we had enough time to do a good job. We really had no choice um, and we built out automation. Now I wanna go into some of the things that we figured out. So one thing is from like, the, the kind of approach to data analysis and reporting I'm gonna talk about is get all of your marketing data into one place and then create dashboards that are views of that data. So in this diagram, uh, the, uh, on the right-hand side, each one of these is meant to be a dashboard for a location. And you could have one dashboard that's for all locations too. But the idea being that you wanna have a dashboard so that you can keep track and maybe you can share it with people involved in that location um, and you're bringing in data from all of these sources and and I'm gonna I'm gonna describe sort of one weird trick one clever trick for how to make this process um, really like insanely efficient uh, once you you have your template dashboard set up uh, the um, I'll have a, a this will be on a slide at the end, but if you're not really comfortable with building dashboards and, and the example I'm gonna give is, is Google Data Studio, 
Uh, we have a workshop coming up on um, building a, a data pipeline to get all of your data in one place. Um, that's in June. And we also are going to be doing um, a workshop on uh, general, like uh, improving your, your data studio skills. So um, those are things to check out. I'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining data studio and how to get your data into one place now. In fact, barely any, uh, but uh, we do have those things coming up. So uh, I'm going to, one thing I will mention here, we use Supermetrics, which is a tool for gathering data from different sources. So we do, um, we manage advertising in, in Google and Facebook and LinkedIn um, and Twitter and, and a few other places. And we can pipe all that data in from using Supermetrics, which is basically like a connector. So we can use it to grab data from Google. Um, in our case, a lot of times we drop it into a spreadsheet um, and then push it into a database. Uh, so really, really super helpful tool for that. Um, all right, so uh, I, wanna, I wanna show you um, what I'm talking about here. So, so I have this data dashboard. So this is a Data Studio dashboard. Um, I really just created it as an example. Uh, and um, I'm gonna go ahead. So I made this dashboard. So I'm gonna share this with you. I, um, you should be, uh, that. Um, So I'm going to share. Oh, looks like Maggie shared. Okay, so Maggie shared a link to the dashboard, and, and if you could share a link to the Google Sheet as well. Um, and and the reason I did that is because what I'm going to show you is so I created this example data set, um, and the the this data set is sort of for these hypothetical four locations, um, and I have. I used Supermetrics to gather this data and drop it into the sheet. And this sheet is the source of data for the Data Studio dashboard. So um, I have a tab here with Google Ads and one for Google Analytics data. Um, and then again, uh, I've got views named location one, location two, location three, location four. And then in the Google Ads data, I have accounts location one, location two, location three, location four. Um, maybe you can see it a little better if I sort this way. Um, so you can see the, the locations there. Uh, and, and again, this is, this is for example pur purposes. This is not the important thing. Um, the, so in Data Studio, uh, those are, are um, set up as data sources. So you can use a Google Sheet as a data source for Data Studio, which is what I'm doing in this case. Um, the, the exciting thing happens when, all right, so if we look at, so this, this table is data from Google Analytics. And I have this view filter set up on here. So um, the, the view filter says, okay, in this dashboard, um, I want you to only show this data. Um, so let's have a look at, at what that um, view, how this view filter is set up. Um, so, all right, so I have the, um, got a, a question about tracking conversions. I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so the, if we go to look at what this filter is doing, what it's saying is, um, when applied to the Google Analytics data source, include views views with the name that contains one right here, okay? So we go back and we look at the other filter I have set up, it's basically the same idea. In this case, it's filtering the Google Ads data set and saying include accounts um, that contain one. Uh, okay, so now we'll go back to our dashboard. So each one of these um, charts and widgets on the dashboard has an, a, this filter applied to it. 
to say only show data for location one. All right, so here's, here's the super cool, mind blowing thing that you can do. So if we think of this as my template, um, and you can, you, you have ad access to this. I would, I guess, prefer that you don't, you know, draw pictures on this day's dashboard, but honestly you could, it doesn't, or I just created it for this webinar. But what you can do is do exactly what I'm gonna do right here. So you can click on file um, and you can say, make a copy uh, and make your own copy. And then uh, you should have access to the sheet as a data source. So it should allow you to, um, maintain the data source. So I'm going to create a copy of this report. And so my, the, the dummy data that I'm using has data for locations one, two, three, and four. So right now my copy is still the same location one data, but I'm going to go here and I'm going to say, okay, let's change this to location three. Uh, and I'm going to change this to location three. Now, it's still got the filters for location one, but what I have to, all I have to do is go in here and edit my filter and change this to three. And I've got one more filter because I've got two filters set up here. Let me change this. And I'm going to save that. So now this dashboard is pulling in data for location three. And, and um, if you, um, well, let's see. Fingers crossed that I'm right. It's pulling in different data now. So I don't know, on the side we have 241.1 K sessions, 113.6 uh, K sessions. So the numbers have all changed. Like this is location one data, this is location three data. And the, we, um, so we actually deployed this approach for a different client that had a uh, hundred locations and the we it, it inevitably happened that we would like the da dashboard that we were working with we would want to pull in new data and so we would be like okay well we want to bring in like google my business data so we can show um how many people are um on google doing clicking on um the link to um get directions for example and and so we want to add that to the dashboard well if you imagine a hundred dashboards, like going into each one and adding the widget and adding the data connection and everything. Um, like that's, that's going to take days to do that across a hundred locations. Whereas we make that change to our template and then we can actually just copy the change over um, to our new dashboard. So, I mean, one of the things that you can do in a, in a dashboard is you can actually just select everything and just copy it. Um, cut and paste, like I copied the entire dashboard, but let's just say that I only want to update like one widget. I can just copy that, paste it over, update the filter, and I'm done. So what could take days um, was something, I mean, still, you know, you're still talking like maybe whatever, three, four, five minutes per location. So it was still a bit of effort with 100 locations, but nothing compared to what it would have been. So. Um, that's that example. Feel free to play around with this, but just this idea of leave your, um, your core dashboard intact. Uh, and in this case, what we did is we did actually have one location that what we treated as our template because we needed like the, we were pulling real data. And so to be able to play around with what graphs and stuff look like, like just to have it be connected to nothing didn't make sense. So so we did use in, in this instance, an actual location as our template. Um, and then we would copy it over and, and change the filters. Um, so before I, I keep going um, again, if you have questions about that and, and Maggie will make sure that I hear questions. Um, I know we've got a couple of questions we'll get to in a little bit. Um, so, 
drop them in there um, or stick around um, to, to get a better, better feeling for that, um, share ideas. So then the other thing that I want to talk about, let's see, why am I going backwards? Um, oh. Okay, sorry. I don't know. My uh, Google Google slides seem to. Well, I don't know if I'm disoriented or they were. Let's assume that I was. But uh, so um, let's see. I this is something Maggie and I were talking about this before um, and sort of like, I don't know, what, what are some organizing ideas? And, and, and Maggie just sort of blurted out the idea of, well, you've got a map, but are you using a compass? Um, I don't know, Maggie, do you wanna sort of explain the thought process behind that idea and question? Yeah, so, okay, this is probably coming from a childhood memory. I don't know if you all use AAA triptychs that had, you know, some poor person has printed out every page of your map and then even went so far as to highlight the route. And so all of a sudden you're you're not sure, you're sure you're on the right road, but you have no idea if you're in, you know, Ohio or Kentucky at this point. And so the idea here is that Yes, most of the time as either business owners or marketers or, you know, analysts, we've got a plan. So we've got our map. We know what we need to accomplish in that day or that week or that month. But it's really, it's really hard to urge yourself to step back and assess, you know, is it successful? So um, that's, I don't know if the analogy is perfect, but if you might have a map, but are you, do you have a compass? Like, do you know where you're going? Do you know where you're heading? Do you know if you're being successful in your journey? Um, and I think it's, it's really, it's really important. This is maybe more important than anything is just having a good understanding of um, how things are working. And that's just all the more harder when you're working across multiple locations um, because the story is sometimes different. So, I don't know if that helps you in this next section, sort of the, lay the groundwork as to how to, you know, achieve that compass mentality, Nico, but that's sort of how I think about it. Yeah. No, I love it. And I love maps and compasses. So, um, so any, any analogy that uses maps and compasses, um, and, and I've certainly spent Plenty of time looking at maps without a compass and wondering where I was. So, how about uh, triptychs? Did you ever use those? I don't remember that, um, but I'm I'm a big wilderness person, and uh, if if you find yourself in the wilderness with a map and no compass, it is problematic. Uh, so, so I, sort of in that spirit, I just wanted to touch on a few things so that like. I guess you know one of our mantras around here is is always about like understanding um, the business and what matters to the business and and I think in the world of marketing as marketers, like a lot of times what we're buying are clicks or impressions or you know the platform we're using is telling us what our click through rate is um, and there's a temptation to report on those things. For various reasons, I mean, one is that that data is readily accessible, um, but but the other is that I think we can be lazy; that those things are pretty easy to measure. So I wanted to just touch on some of the things that are less easy to measure but important. Um, so the on, on the left hand side, sales uh, we do so uh, a number of our clients have do, uh, have an do e-commerce, but they also have physical locations, or in some cases, maybe they're a brand um, and, and you can buy their products through locations um, and they care about both. Like when they do marketing, if you wanna go to their website and buy online, great, but if you wanna go to a store and buy it 
um, they're happy too. So, um, so, so just measuring e-commerce is certainly something that we do a lot. Um, I mentioned before being able to know when people click to get directions via Google My Business or on your website is a really strong positive indicator of interest um, that's short of a store visit. Um, the phone calls, so with, with Google Ads, uh, there's, you have free call tracking. Um, we use CallRail, which is, is really quite inexpensive for call tracking. But using some kind of call tracking solution, uh, CallRail integrates with Google Analytics. So when somebody calls your business, uh, it shows up in Google Analytics, um, and it shows up as an event that you can make a conversion. Um, and then sort of last, and but not at all least, uh, store visits, which I think it's weird that Google hasn't been talking about this more, but in Google Analytics, you can report on store visits, um, but there's a few things that you have to have in place for it to work. So uh, in your Google Analytics account, what you have to do is, link it to your Google Ads account. And if you don't have a Google Ads account, interestingly, it doesn't actually matter if you're paying for Google Ads, you just need to have an account. So link it to Google Ads, and then your Google Ads account needs to be linked to your Google My Business pages. So what that means is that um, you have to have access to the login for your Google My Business pages. Um, and then when you're in Google Ads, you can log in to, to your Google My Business account and link up your locations. Um, so, so what that does is that tells Google like these actual addresses are your businesses. And that information pipes through Google Ads and into Google Analytics. So then Google can measure by, because people are um, on their devices, have um, like, most people are logged into Google somehow or another. If you're on an Android, you're always logged into Google. But if you're on an iPhone, chances are you use Gmail, you use Google Maps, um, maybe YouTube. There's something, you're you Chrome. You're using something that's logged into Google. And, and so Google can tie that person back um, to the, the click that got them there. Um, so this is unbelievably powerful but you have to have those steps. Um, uh, you have to have each of those things in place. And there are some volume uh, conditions. So uh, it, it take, can take a little bit of time for Google to get to the point where there's sufficient data. One thing that Google doesn't like to do is show data that you could um, infer back to an individual, right? And so, so what that could mean is that uh, if somebody comes into your store and says, oh, I found you on Google, um, Google doesn't want you to be able to tie that to their online behavior. So they need to have enough data that, that it's aggregated. So there's no risk of you as a business being able to say, oh, you're the person who did X. Um, Google is, is uh, uh, in that regard, is very careful about privacy. The other KPI that I want to mention here is store visit proxies, which if you don't have store visits, then setting up a proxy metric in place um, which is usually like a compound met metric, um, which you can um, you can set that up in in goal in Google Analytics. You can actually make metrics that are a combination of other metrics, or maybe you do it by exporting into a spreadsheet. But in that case, what you're looking at, like if you don't have uh, store visit data coming um, directly out of Google Analytics, what you could do is do things like, well, I think that when people go to a location page on my website. Um, there's a likelihood that they're going to visit my location. Um, personally, I use as a rule of thumb that about 50% of people do that actually end up visiting a location. And that's based on some, um, some data that Google released a few years ago. Um, and I think they said it was higher than that, but I rounded down to 50%, um, figuring that, that uh, maybe Google was, was rounding up a little bit. Um, so. Uh, sort of back to, to Maggie's uh, compass and map analogy. Uh, you need these compass metrics in place um, to try to just cut through the noise, right? Like again, multi locations, you can't afford to waste time. Okay, so building the automation toolkit, um, going to, uh, so back to our template driven mindset. 
So the thing that I'm gonna have, like really focus on here, I mean, there are a lot of ways that automation can improve marketing efficiency and quality. The, in a, in a multi-location context, one of the things that we do a lot is the same idea of put energy into the template and then create tools that make it easy for us to make copies. And so I'm gonna walk through a pretty detailed example of that right now. Okay, so um, this is my sort of, uh, what should we say, expressionistic way of, of talking about the idea of lean automation. So um, if you think about sort of the software that costs thousands of dollars and, and um, you need to pay for support on and uh, it does all kinds of things. Well, that's, from my point of view, that's your imperial walker. And, and um, the days of, of sort of enterprise software, big software packages that do all kinds of stuff, um, that is, uh, well, let's just say the fate of those platforms doesn't look a lot different than uh, this Imperial Walker. The approach I'm gonna show you is um, like the little dude that's flying around in circles uh, around the Walker. Um, uh, so, you know, if you wanna think of the Walker as your competition and um, the little dude as, as, as you, then, um, you know, it's not a bad way to look at it. So. All right, so let me, sorry, the chosen one. <laughs> I thought that was from the, the uh, original uh, Empire Strikes Back, but shows, shows what I know that I'm not actually 100% sure. Um, okay, so, so lean automation, what do I mean by lean auto automation? What I mean is that nowadays, you don't actually need to be a pro programmer to automate that Tool, like we have tools like really just Google Sheets. And, and if you're more of an Excel junkie, um, most of the things you can do in, in Google Sheets, you can do in Excel. Um, the, uh, but, but then also a few other tools like um, Zapier or Integromat, which are tools that uh, can talk to APIs and, and without programming, you can say, hey, when um, this piece of data arrives in my email, my email, I wanna push it over to here and do this with it. Um, you could do some, some just insanely cool automations without ever writing a line of code. So um, then sort of moving on up the scale, um, and I'll talk about this more, but we use Google Apps Script a lot, um, which integrates with Google Docs um, and makes automation um, really, really easy. We are not a software development organization, um, but we've built a lot of tools um, really, I guess, sort of, you know, kind of in our spare time. I mean, not really our spare time, but without actually up until very recently having anybody that, that would count as a, as a dedicated programmer. So, um, and the example I'm gonna walk through um, was done by me at a, Time when I was very much learning Google Apps Script um, and was far from a actual uh, programmer. So, all right, so, so what are the ideas? So one idea is that what you wanna do is focus on getting problems solved, focus on getting stuff done quickly, focus on being fast. So um, one of the downfalls of, of organizations that pay for software is well, we paid for the license or we built the tool, so now we gotta use it. So if you pay less or spend less time building it, um, then you're less likely to get caught in that trap. So, and, and the thing is that the, the world that we're working in, digital marketing changes so fast um, that the like investing in, in platforms that took a while to build or are really expensive, I can tell you from experience, I used to be the product manager for Atlas Search, which was a tool set for managing search campaigns. Um, and it was supposed to be this comprehensive platform that made your life easy and automated way, away most of the tasks of search engine marketing. Um, and the, I can tell you that we had really smart people doing great work 
and we couldn't keep up with Google. Google would release changes so fast. And, and as we grew, we had a bigger software development team. It got slower to get things into production. And Google was changing too fast. Um, and we just fell behind. And, and it got to the point where um, it, we, couldn't, we just couldn't keep up. So um, I'm a real believer that that will always be true in, in an environment like digital marketing where things change more quickly than the builders of big complicated tools can keep up. Um, build what you have to. There's, there's like, what's sort of amazing about the world of software now is most, I mean, there's an API for nearly everything that you can access for free. So like it still costs money to buy software and buy licenses for stuff. Um, but there's, there's a shocking amount of functionality out there via API that you don't have to pay a penny for. And you, Google makes nearly everything available via API. So, um, so being able to fetch that data. Um, so don't build what you don't need to. Um, try to like think about tool building. Like if you're working by yourself, then um, a democracy of one is pretty easy to achieve. But if you're working with other people, try to empower the people that you work with to get better at tool building. And I'm gonna talk through how we've done this with Google Sheets, but one of the ways to do that is just to teach people some of the more powerful functions in Google Sheets. So um, in Google Sheets, you have things like there's a query function that you can actually use to write SQL-like queries of data. Really powerful. And, and Anybody that likes working in spreadsheets gets pretty excited once they get the hang of the query formula. It's a little, the learning curve's a little steep at first, um, but you can do crazy cool things with it. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean getting everybody up to speed in everything that you do, um, but this idea of starting to empower people. So sort of the last main point is that, like my experience at Atlas Search, like the marketing automation platforms result in mediocrity at scale, that, that building um, complicated tools uh, that can't keep up means you can be really efficient at being mediocre. So don't try to replace people, try to give people tools that make their jobs easier and more fun. So the way that we do this, um, we have this kind of workflow where um, we use Google Sheets. We start by automating with formulas in Google Sheets. Um, and and I, can, I, I can hop into an example of that in a second. But the, um, then we use Google Apps Script a lot, uh, which integrates with Google Sheets. Basically, every Google Sheet, um, you can just open the script editor and, and uh, write scripts to automate things that you're doing in the sheet. And in the world of marketing, I mean, I guess maybe some of you are, are creative marketers, but we are, you know, we're a very market analytical marketing agency. And I got to tell you, everybody has multiple spreadsheets open all day. So um, most of what we do involves spreadsheets. And so the ability to quickly and easily automate using spreadsheets has been game changing for us. So, so kind of step one is somebody just automates a task using formulas. Um, that gets bogged down when you're dealing with a lot of data and you start adding too many formulas. So then maybe you or, or maybe the person sitting next to you knows enough app scripts to say, okay, now it's time to make this more automated, more efficient. Um, and then if we get to the point where like this tool is useful for people in our organization or our clients, then we start to take it more seriously and just have code reviews and QA and source control, um, integrate with APIs so you're not like having to cut and paste data and copy it in and that sort of thing. But, but the main thing being, and this is honestly like I've, you know, I have been around automation for a long time. Um, I'm really not a, a, a full-blown programmer, but one of the first things that I'll say to somebody who comes to me and says, hey, I think we should automate X is, have you built a proof of concept in a spreadsheet? Because until you can show me the steps in a spreadsheet, you're not ready to have a conversation about automation. That if somebody can't articulate exactly the steps they want done, um, clearly, and a really clear way to do it is to show those steps in a spreadsheet, then they need to go, go back to and, and think through the process that they want to automate more. Because the last thing you want to be doing is guessing at the end result that somebody is really looking for. So using that spreadsheet as a way to gather requirements. Um, the, uh, yeah, so Noah says, build the deliverable and then decide if it's worth sinking time into it. Yeah, that's actually, a different sort of nuance in the same point is if like 
say what you want the end result to look like um, and work backwards from there and make sure that you have um, buy-in on, on what the end result is going to look like before you ask somebody to spend time automating. Um, all right, so I want to give you uh, my last uh, demo um, before we switch over to uh, office hours. Um, and, and no, that's not me. I could ride a unicycle at one time, but I've never been able to play guitar. So, um, but I could hold the guitar, which as far as you know, is all that does. Um, wait, that's not my demo. I need to switch over to my demo. Uh, actually, in this case, okay. So what I want to show you is that the, the tool that we ended up building that took our account builds from three hours down to 20 minutes. And this was mostly in Google Sheets. So, and this process started the way that I described, like, like what we started out by doing was just creating formulas. Um, and, and let me, uh, let's see if I can get this right. But, um, cause I, I did not prepare for this in advance. But, so let's just say that I have um, the, I have Denver over here and then I have a template, um, so I'm going to say apartments for rent. And then I'm going to say location. Um, and then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say um, replace. And I'm going to say oh, sorry, substitute. So text to search, search for replace with. So I'm gonna say search this, I'm gonna say, and then search for location. And then I'm going to say, replace it with the contents of cell A1. So now what I've done here is I built this template and I have, so this would be an example of like a keyword um, and I'm just substituting out Denver. And so if I have apartments for rent and other places, um, then I can substitute out the different locations. One of the things that I did here, and this is just a convention, is I stuck these square brackets around it so that the text would never accidentally occur um, in uh, what I was replacing. Because like, like, an like I learned that the hard way um, by having, um, the, like, <clears throat> I remember at one point I used SA for state abbreviation, um, and, uh, I can't actually remember off the top of my head, but, but. San, San Antonio? Yeah, for example, San Antonio. Anyway, I had strings that had SA in them plenty of times, and then I substituted state abbreviation, like TX for Texas or something, and ended up with this weird gobbledygook. So having a parameter in here that you never have to worry about it accidentally occurring. Um, so then if you imagine, so what I can do here is I can just sort of drag this down and then I can say, um, so Boulder um, and uh, Longmont. Um, and you get the idea, right? So, so I'm building different variations of my keywords using templates. So so we created templates for building keywords and ads, um, different ingredients of campaigns. And then it got to the point where it's like, okay, well, let's, let's take this to another level. Like it's, this is improving efficiency, but why can't we improve the whole thing? So what we did is we use um, Google uh, Ads Editor, which is a downloadable tool. Um, for managing campaigns. And there's a specific format for uh, a, like basically you can import an entire campaign. And that format is just, um, it's, it's really just columns and rows like a spreadsheet. So, um, so what we did is we, we created this tool that would take these templates. And I guess in this case, I've got exclamation point, exclamation point for the things that I'm substituting. Um, so I have templates in here and I say, uh, in this case, um, this parameter here is just an L, which stands for locations. 
that part doesn't really matter. I mean, the idea is that we have a template and we're gonna substitute out different parameters in the template. And so this one has parameter two. Um, I've got all these things in here. This is really just an advanced version of what I did here, is that I've got a list of things that I wanna do substituting with. So those are keyword templates and then I have add templates that do the same thing. But these are just patterns that I'm just gonna replace values with. And then, I have these set of values for different campaigns that I wanna build. So I can go through here and I can just check. So I've got an apartment building um, in uh, Denver that I'm calling location one. Um, and I've filled out a few of the parameters that I'm gonna use. And these are really just things I decided in advance that when I use parameter two, that's gonna be the zip code. Um, and uh, I've got a bunch of variables that I can use that are going to substitute out to build the campaign. So I, then using Google Apps Script, I have this TO scripts menu, which basically just runs this script that automates the process of doing a whole bunch of, of substituting. So now what it's done is it's really just grabbed all those template values and it's built out a campaign according to what I needed. So it took a while to create, the, and, and I can actually just take this and I can, I can do one of two things. I can actually paste it into to, uh, ads editor or from here, what I can do is download this as a uh, CSV file and then import it into Google ads editor. Um, so, um, so that's uh, like, we're, we're at the end of the first hour here and, and some of you may have to go. Um, so I definitely wanted you to see that. I'm gonna just step in a little bit and just show you a little bit about what's under the hood. This isn't a lesson in how to use Google Apps Script, but um, if you look, so in every spreadsheet, you have this, this script editor and you can just open that up. Um, and switch that here. So I can log in to see the script. Um, and these are the scripts that uh, I wrote to automatically build this campaign. And again, all it's doing is um, just basically automating the process that I showed here. Like first we created formulas to do everything um, and then automated step by step until it built an entire campaign. Um, and it took a little bit of while, a little time to build it. And in, in our case, we were dealing with multiple um, clients that were renting apartments, um, a bunch of locations. It was worth spending a little bit of time. Um, <clears throat> so, um, well, a question here that's relevant. So, could you push the ads to the ads API? Um, yes, and and the actually the way that I've tended to do that is um, there's a scripting environment built into Google Ads. Uh, so, um, the, which is a little bit easier, I think, to work with. There's some authentication uh, trickiness and you need to uh, get a license key to use the API in Google Ads. But anybody can um, do Google Ads script, which works very much the same way as Google Apps Script. Um, so what I've done is to have actually the script come and fetch the, the, the data from the sheet and build it that way. Um, but you could also push it directly to the API, certainly if you get to that point. Um, this, one, you know, one thing I will say is like automate, but always take into account how long it takes to do something versus how long it would take to automate it. So this process um, like allows me, so I can go in, like I can, I can, I just ran that export um, and then I can open Google Ads Editor and I can import the file. I can actually preview the entire campaign before I push it to Google Ads, which is kind of nice and important, and then push it to Google Ads. If I didn't do the preview step, we're talking about a couple of minutes to do the whole thing. So it doesn't actually save me that much time to integrate with the Google Ads API. I think that's worth it if you're, if you're really um, doing this sort of in the hundreds or thousands. Um, but if you're doing it in the several or tens, um, probably not worth it. Uh, okay, so I'd like to, to move on um, to uh, a little bit of office hours. Um, 
So a few things I wanted to mention. Uh, we, I mentioned before, um, we're gonna be doing this uh, Data Studio um, three course program, uh, not scheduled yet, but maybe reach out to Maggie if you're interested. Um, the, we're doing a, the building the data pipeline workshop um, on June 18th. Uh, oops, there's a complicated Bitly link here, or you could just go to our website and, and um, there's, uh, well, let me, oh, I'll show you that right here. If you go to, probably you've been there since you've signed up for this, but um, just in case, uh, if you go here um, and you go to training, then you can see a list of upcoming workshops. So uh, the data pipeline workshop is on uh, 18th of June. And then from here you can sign up. Uh, okay, so a few other workshops. Um, we're gonna be doing two more multi-location workshops. Uh, one for SEO and content marketing and one for paid search and social media. Um, uh, in June and July. And then the other thing I wanted to point you to is, um, so Ben Collins, who's kind of, I don't know, one of the sort of well-regarded gurus of Google Apps Script, has a free course. And if you just search um, the Apps Script blast off, it'll take you, I mean, Google, that'll be the first result, or go to bencollins.com. Uh, a great free course in learning Google Apps Script one thing I didn't show you, um, but uh, in Google, one of the things that you can do in Google Apps Script as you're learning is very much like Excel, if you use the macro recording functionality in Excel, is um, you can actually record um, the uh, macros from here, um, and that'll generate a Google Apps Script. So if I, um, if I start recording, um, a, a macro here and uh, I don't know, just, just do this um, and whatever, um, let's say, and this is just a simple example. If you use the macro recording feature of Excel, it'd be familiar to you. Um, the, so um, now, if I, oh, I gotta stop recording. Uh, so I'll just do an example. And then for here, it says a link to edit script and I can open it up. Um, and every time it makes me log in again. And then it shows me what I just did. So this actually builds a lot of the script for you. So even if you have fairly beginner Google Apps Script skills, you can get a lot done by just doing it in, um, in, in Google Apps um, and then uh, coming here, looking at your, your macro and then tweaking it um, to do exactly what you want. So. Uh, All right, that's what I have. Um, here's my contact info. Uh, reach out with questions, stick around, and um, let's stay in touch. So thank you everybody for being here. Like I said, I'm not leaving. Um, we're gonna stick around for office hours, but um, if you need to go, uh, really loved having you.